What is up everybody? Random Random Man here and 2017 is just about over. I cannot believe how fast this year has already gone by as it is time for me to talk about what have been my favorite movies of this past year. Now before I run down my favorite movies of the year, I want to let you all know about some disclaimers. Firstly, I have not seen every movie this year that I've wanted to see. There are some movies that are coming around during this award season that are going to expand by early 2018 that I haven't seen yet. So titles such as Call Me By Your Name, Darkest Hour, and I, Tanya, I will see in review but will not be featured on this list. Yet, I have still topped myself compared to recent years past in terms of how many movies I have seen and reviewed this year, as I have seen and reviewed a record-breaking 53 movies this year. That is crazy. Two of them were Netflix releases, and 51 of them were in theaters. That is something that I did not think I would top, but I have, so I have a bunch of movies that I've seen and reviewed, and now there are many that I do want to talk about. Yes, many that I do want to talk about, because as you've probably implied from the title, I've cheated a little bit. I'm not doing a typical top 10 list for my favorite movies of the year this year, as I've extended it to a top 17 movies that I consider my favorites from 2017. There are just so many movies that I saw this year that I felt were great, and I did not want to leave off many of them to be talked about. And I've done this before, 2014, I did my top 14 of 2014, top 15 of 2015. Last year, I only did a regular top 10 of 2016 to not be repetitive, but again, I've broken that rule and extended my list considerably. Last thing I will mention before getting into the nitty gritty is that I will not be doing a worst of list as I have not done in years past as well because I want to just focus on the positives from this year. And this year in particular, I haven't seen that many movies at all that have pissed me off in particular. If any of you want to know what the worst movie I've seen in 2017 is, that would be James Ponsolt's The Circle. Congratulations! You were the only movie that I saw and reviewed this year that I rated lower than two and a half out of five stars, and it did piss me off. This was also a disappointment from this co-writer and director as it had a concept that could have been a biting social commentary with technology, yet it ended up being so misguided and pretentious that my jaw literally dropped to the floor by the time the end credits started rolling, as I've said in my full review. And it just wasted a cast of talent with Emma Watson, Tom Hanks, a bunch of other people. <clears throat> Awful movie. That's my worst of 2017 for ya. I will leave a link to my full review for that movie and links to my reviews of other movies that I mentioned throughout this video in the description in case you want to know my more in-depth thoughts on those films. So now that I've gotten all that out of the way, let's get into the good stuff. Now before I get into my actual list, I do have some honorable mentions that I want to read off. Yes, even though I've extended my favorites list to a top 17, I do have some honorable mentions that I feel are worthy to note because these are movies that I've enjoyed a ton. Plus, it's my list. I can do whatever I want with it. My opinion, you respect mine, I respect yours, that kind of thing. You can consider these movies also to be my numbers 25 to 18 of my favorites. So, honorable mentions. We have Mother, what I feel is the most controversial movie of the year from writer-director Darren Aronofsky. People either love it, people either hate it. I feel that this is a movie that's going to be hailed as a masterpiece later down the line for how ballsy it is in nature, its metaphorical nature in the literal sense, all of it. It has not left my head ever since I saw it for the first time, and I think it boasts a fantastic lead performance from Jennifer Lawrence, and it stuck out to me more even on a rewatch. There's also Gifted, a neat little movie from uh, Mark Webb starring Chris Evans and McKenna Grace that is just a sweet little film about a father-daughter type relationship between an uncle and a niece and about a little gifted person in the middle of all of it. 
wonder. This movie has stuck out to me more and more ever since I've thought about it and seen it. The message really resonated with me about choosing kind and being kind to others. More and more people should see this film. Thor Ragnarok, not only do I think is this the best Thor movie we have ever gotten, but it's also one of the most fun times I've had at the movies all year. Mm. Personal shopper, an art house psychological thriller that boasts a fantastic, fantastic lead performance from Kristen Stewart, who I feel does not get enough credit. And what Olivier Isaias also did in being another thought-provoking film left me just thinking about it more and more. Okja, Netflix's big release from over the summer from director Bong Joon-ho, really had a message that did strike a chord with me, but was also a neat little anime-inspired adventure. Professor Marston and the Wonder Women, a criminally underseen biopic that I think comic book fans in particular will get a kick out of seeing if they have not heard or known about the origins of Wonder Woman from the three individuals who helped make her popularity happen. And Battle of the Sexes, another biopic that I think has gone under the radar as of now. It is about the tennis match between Bobby Riggs and Billie Jean King and Steve Carell and Emma Stone respectively give great performances as those figures. And it was an engaging biopic to me that had a lot of nice messages in it as well. So now that I've gotten my honorable mentions out of the way, let's get into my actual top 17 favorite movies of 2017. Number 17, The Disaster Artist. Who would have thought that a movie about the making of Tommy Wiseau's infamous The Room would turn out to be a very touching and inspirational tale about somebody who was not afraid to fail in the most unconventional uh, sorts. James Franco delivered an excellent lead performance as Tommy Wiseau with an uncanny accent and personality to him that exuded on screen along with the rest of the players that do show up in the film. Franco also did a superb job directing this film. If it is true that he directed this movie while in character as Tommy Wiseau, he really did bring a tale that will inspire people to make their own films, but also get them more interested in the room. Number 16, Star Wars The Last Jedi. This is another controversial movie of sorts, at least among Star Wars fans, as this has polarized them left and right for being too different or not being the Star Wars movie that they expected. Me though, I love this film for how it was not only refreshing in tone, but also its structure. It's beautiful to look at, powerfully executed, not only in its performances, but also some of the moments in between. What writer-director Ryan Johnson did was take some bold risks, and I felt that they do pay off, as this is one of the finest Star Wars films that we have ever gotten. Number 15, War for the Planet of the Apes, the third and final entry in the recent Planet of the Apes trilogy that we have gotten, bolstered by an amazing lead performance from Andy Serkis as Caesar, completing his story arc in a satisfying way. The other players in this movie are worthy mentions as well, with Woody Harrelson as the grueling villain and the visuals all of it, some of the best visual effects I've ever seen on the primates themselves. And it's less emphasis on war as it is a personal and more emotional tale for Caesar and company. Director Matt Reeves, who previously directed Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, did something really satisfying as well with War for the Planet of the Apes in completing this memorable trilogy. Number 14, Ingrid Goes West. Yes, some of you have might not even heard of this movie. This is a gem of an indie film that came out over the summer, co-written and directed by Matt Spicer, and what a stunning directorial debut from him as it tells the story of a social media obsessed woman, played by Aubrey Plaza, fantastic performance, who goes west 
to California to stalk an Instagram figure whom she idolizes, played by Elizabeth Olsen, also great in the film. This is a movie that is unconventional and off-kilter that left me not only laughing a lot, but also thinking about it in terms of having sympathy for the main character, providing some punchy social commentary in our social media-obsessed world today. Number 13, Logan. And if you're wondering why this Blu-ray is so big, I got the Target exclusive digibook for this film, and what a movie. This is a perfect swan song for Logan slash Wolverine to go out on. If this is Hugh Jackman's final performance as his character, he delivered an excellent performance. Daphne Keene and Patrick Stewart are also great as supporting players. The brutal, hard-hitting rated R violence not only served to be satisfying to look at on screen, but also served to complement the really emotional story that we got in Logan going through some shit, but also showing off how this movie transcended both the comic book and superhero genres to be not just the best, within those genres of this year but also one of the best comic book and superhero movies of all time that glossed over into being a western inspired drama number 12 detroit this at times hard to watch intense true life based drama where it spotlights the algiers motel incident that took place in the titular city 50 years ago had me invested not only for seeing how the story would be played out and dramatized on screen but also with the performances that we've gotten from some notable players including will poulter and algie smith writer mark bull and director Catherine Bigelow have delivered their finest work of recent memory that is not going to satisfy a lot of people and it's already pissed some people off as well and this movie has flown under the radar since its summer release but I feel that this is a necessary movie to view in today's day and age. Number 11, Wind River. From writer-director Taylor Sheridan, who previously penned the scripts for Sigario and Heller Highwater, he delivered another tale with a subject matter that is biting in its necessary social commentary to be told, this time in the title reservation in Wyoming, where a bunch of disenfranchised Native Americans experience hardship and also boast some great performances from Jeremy Renner, among the best in his career, and Elizabeth Olsen. Like Detroit, this is not an easy one to watch for how grueling it can be at times, but like Detroit, it also provides some necessary uh, viewership to be had as these are the two most important movies of the year in my eyes. Now we are heading into my top 10, as at number 10 is Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. This is a black dramedy that also features another strong leading female performance from Frances McDormand who delivers one of her finest performances to date, being very angry, grieving over her murdered and raped daughter and wants some answers out of the incompetent police in her fictional town of Ebbing, Missouri. Also delivering performances from the ensemble cast are Woody Harrelson and Sam Rockwell among others. Writer-director Martin McDonough has crafted a really thought-provoking script that got a lot more emotion out of me than I expected the more I think about it. And it's just a very funny and dramatic movie that balances its tone so well. One of the best acted movies I've seen all year and one of the most well-written and well-directed movies of the year as well. Number nine, The Big Sick. A darling from the Sundance Film Festival earlier this year and the finest comedy of the year, I might add. Well, there's another movie coming later down the list that is a comedy of sorts, but in terms of how this film holds up, this is a sweet, unconventional romantic comedy of sorts, loosely based on the real-life relationship between Kamel Nanjiani and Emily V. Gordon, whom both co-wrote the screenplay to this film. We get funny performances from Kamel, Zoe Kazan as Emily, Ray Romano and Holly Hunter as Emily's parents, and the direction by Michael Showalter is also fine, but the writing is really what stands out here in being a sweet, charming, and funny script that made me laugh. Number eight, A Ghost Story. Another movie from this year's Sundance Film Festival that garnered a lot of attention. And you would think that from the Blu-ray cover slash poster to this film that it looks like a horror film. 
This movie is anything but that, as writer-director David Lowry delivered a powerful and intimate tale about love, loss, and loneliness that boasts some performances from Casey Affleck and Rooney Mara that are powerful. Casey Affleck may or may not be under this bed sheet throughout the entire film, but Mara in particular, with the raw pathos that she delivers with that now infamous scene of her eating an entire pie in five minutes, uncut, long take, all of that, I was mesmerized by how into the movie I was in telling a story that related a lot to me, even though I haven't been on this earth long enough to know about a lot of the big themes that this movie does tell, but I was truly impacted by this film. I actually rewatched this last night and it still holds up and it is best viewed on multiple viewings. Number seven, The Shape of Water, the latest addition to my favorites list coming from co-writer and director Guillermo del Toro, who is the king of monster designs and atmosphere in the world building that he has made in his illustrious career. This boasts my favorite performance of the year in Sally Hawkins as the mute custodian who falls in love with an amphibious creature played by Doug Jones, also great, that is being held in the facility that Hawkins' character works at. This is an unconventional love story, but it's so believable in how Del Toro masters his craft in world building, the designs, everything in this movie, how it takes place in the 1960s, and it makes itself be so unique in how by the end, it just felt like such a magical fairy tale for adults. Number six, Get Out. Remember how I said that The Big Sick was the finest comedy I've seen all year? Well, uh, in terms of which movie I've laughed at the most watching, this would be it. And this is also one of, if not the most surprising movies I've seen all year as horror is not my favorite genre. It's my least favorite genre of film, as I've stated many times before. But I would argue that this is a comedy horror hybrid satire. At least the Hollywood Foreign Press Association does agree that this is a comedy. So um, with this movie though, this is a stellar debut from writer-director Jordan Peele, who came from comedy, but also served up a horror film that is literally something else, a league of its own, boasting uh, great performances, especially from Daniel Kaluuya in the lead, is at times funny, is at times scary, really thought provoking in its social commentary, in being something that you will discover new details in the more and more you watch this film. I certainly noticed more details upon rewatch. This is a movie that is excellent in what it does, and it does so really well. Now we are getting into my top five, and at number five is Coco. Disney and Pixar have knocked it out of the park once again, delivering another animated movie that I feel is the best and my favorite of the entire year with the spotlighting of Mexican culture with Dia de los Muertos and telling a story that we have seen done a million times before, but it has a great spin on it, giving us characters we really care for, colorfully amazing animation, and music that is so memorable in my eyes and definitely added to the deep emotional impact that this movie had on me and other people within the Mexican community and even people who are non-Mexican that were just into this wonderful animated film. Now we are getting into the four movies that I've seen and reviewed this year that I've given my highest honor, the perfect score of five out of five stars. These movies could easily be switched around in my eyes, but for now, as it stands, at my number four is Lady Bird. Writer-director Greta Gerwig, in her solo debut, delivered a coming-of-age story that does remind me a lot of other films from recent memory, but it's unique in its own sense in how it tells a story that is not focused on romance and is just focused on telling a story within a period piece setting as well, giving us phenomenal performances from Saoirse Ronan as the title character and Laurie Metcalf as her mother, among other notable players. Players. This is a relatable, charming, sweet, even at times serious movie that went all the way in making it be complete to me in so many levels. Now entering the top three, at number three is 
Blade Runner 2049. Yes, I'm pronouncing the title that way still. Not 2049, 2049. But either way, the sequel to the 1982 Blade Runner is debatably better than the original film as that film is already considered a masterpiece. But what director Denis Villeneuve did with recreating the immersive world that was created in the original film by Ridley Scott worked wonders in being such a vibrant experience. Cinematographer Roger Deakins, I cannot sing his praises more highly enough. He is the GOAT when it comes to cinematography, among many other things that made this movie work so, so immensely well. Ryan Gosling, Harrison Ford, all the performances, the way the story even played out in its vagueness, in leaving me interested in solving the mystery within my head and playing out throughout its almost three hours our running time. This was such a mesmerizing experience to behold. Number two, Dunkirk. This was my most anticipated movie of 2017 and it did not disappoint in the slightest. Here I have the Best Buy exclusive steelbook for it and coming from writer-director Christopher Nolan, this is among his finest work in his filmography. At this movie's core is an experimental big budget war film that is not a war film in the conventional sense as it is a rescue slash escape movie featuring mostly uh, silent performances devoid of much dialogue but what Nolan set out to prove with this film was that he could make a movie that is mostly a visual and auditory experience to get you involved in how a lot of these terrified young men were feeling during World War II. All of it, the technical merits, how it looks, how it sounds, Nolan's attention to detail and trying to be as realistic as possible. He has made, in my opinion, the best war movie of the decade. Finally, we are at number one, the top spot, the big kahuna. What topped my favorites list of 2017 for movies? Well, if you know me personally, you already know what that movie is. But for those of you who don't, my favorite movie of 2017 is Baby Driver. Going into 2017, I had some anticipation for this movie, but I did not expect to be so suckered in by this film from its opening scene all the way to the end credits. Writer-director Edgar Wright had previously made movies that I did enjoy, but this is now my favorite movie of his for how he created a bunch of aspects that struck every chord with me and what I love about film and filmmaking. The action, the comedy, the drama, the romance, all of that worked perfectly and seamlessly well, in my opinion, for this film. The performances from every actor involved in this film, how kinetic it is, high energy, the music and how integral it is to the story and the action, the way it is edited, directed, shot, all of it. This is a movie that I had an immense amount of fun watching and I just adore dissecting what details come with it as this is a movie I could see myself watching over and over again and not get tired of it. Baby Driver, my favorite movie of 2017. Oof. And there we go. My top 17 favorite movies of 2017 and then some all covered. Thank you all, as always, for watching, and especially to those in particular who have stuck it out till this portion of the video. I would like to give a special thank you to any of you who have watched any and all of my reviews throughout 2017. I love talking about all things film. I love you all. I hope to continue to do this in the foreseeable future, and hopefully there are more good things to come until then. Thank you all, as always, for watching. Be sure to like this video, comment your favorite movies of 2017, social media links in the description, subscribe to my channel for more, and I'll catch you on the next movie review in 2018.